crazy legal maneuver by every town for gun safety in the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. That's the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York City in the Antioch and Nagrelli case. Uh, you're not going to believe what every town just tried to pull. It's not going to work. It's silly, but they did it anyway. We'll talk about it when we get back. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Box of Diner, proud American gun and a constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Keep and Bear Arms. Obviously, it also should have taught what the Israelis should have learned about the right to keep and bear arms from the Ukraine War, a lesson apparently they did not learn. Okay. All right, folks. So here we go. Antonyuk versus Negrelli. You may remember this case. United States Court of Appeals, the Second Circuit, New York City. Big oral argument, lots of briefing here. It went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court indicated that we're going to watch this case carefully. The Second Circuit has been sitting on this case and supposedly writing opinions for many, many, many months. Um, I'm not saying they're dragging their feet, but it's taken them a while. These courts do go slow, unfortunately, because these opinions are long and there's a lot of sight checking and whatnot that has to be done. Nevertheless, I want to bring you up to speed with some developments that actually may backfire, backfire on the anti-gunners, and you'll see why in a second. Specifically, um, the group Every Town for Gun Safety has filed a letter, what is known as a 28J letter to the Second Circuit, trying to bring to the attention of this federal court additional historical analog laws. Now, this is a no-no. This is a no-no because under uh, 28J, without boring you, that is designed to bring to a court's attention if there is a recent court decision. So that touches on the same issue the courts decide. And so, for example, if the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which in the Antonyuk case we're talking about here, which is dealing with quote unquote sensitive places, which, as you know, is a euphemism for government mandated gun free zones, which are really kill zones, unfortunately, because you're inviting bad people to do bad things to good people and disarming the good people, as Cesar Beccari warned us against before the founding fathers even wrote the Second Amendment. Uh, nevertheless, that is what the Antonyuk case is dealing with government mandated gun free zones and sensitive places because they try to make all of New York a sensitive place. And there's a big Second Amendment challenge there. So it's before the United States Court of Appeals for the Second uh, Circuit. And the idea of these uh, Rule 28J letters is, again, let's assume, hypothetically speaking, another major court issued a ruling dealing with sensitive places in the Second Amendment. Well, a party could, in that situation, write a letter to the Second Circuit and say, Dear judges, we want to bring something to your attention that we think you might want to know about another sister court of appeals in the Sixth Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, the Ninth Circuit, whatever it is, has just decided a case on very similar grounds or touching on laws or whatever it is that is relevant or relates to what you're going to decide. So you ought to be aware of it because it might help you, Second Circuit Court of Appeals, make a decision. That's the purpose of 28J letters. Now, there's two critical things here that are not met, two criteria that are not satisfied by every time. First is these 28J letters are almost always supposed to be written by parties, parties to the case, you see. Now, every town is not a party to the case. They are an amicus, which means they're a friend of the court. They're not a party. They're not Mr. They don't, they're not Mr. Anton Young. They're not the government of New York. They're not a party, okay? So the fact that a non-party wrote a 28J letter is highly, shall we say, irregular, number one. Number two is, again, the purpose of these letters is usually to say there's a recent decision by a sister court that's relevant to what you're deciding, check it out court, you should be aware of it. That's the purpose of it. Now, what, what happened here, though, is every town is not using it to bring, the sec to bring the attention to the Second Circuit of another recent decision. Instead, they're really trying to turn this into a supplemental briefing because what they're saying is we are submitting an additional uh, 53, I'm trying to look at the number here, but dozens and dozens, it looks like, yes, every town has identified an additional 53, 53 additional examples and sources that speak to restrictions on firearms in parks and a compilation of them. So they're basically trying to say that, yeah, we know, you know, the anti-gun movement in America with the state of New York, which has a multi, multi-billion dollar budget, 
Yeah, we know. We've been fighting guns for decades, literally decades. And we've been fighting Heller since 2008. And there's been infinite amount of money put in by anti-gun billionaires and nonprofit groups and litigation groups. And all of the cities of Chicago, Los Angeles, California, and so on, blah, 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 have been doing nothing but researching anti-gun history and anti-gun everything for literally decades. But so we just came up in the last few months with these additional 53 examples of additional historical analog laws that we think are relevant we should brought, be brought to your attention. Now, of course, this is really a form of supplemental briefing, uh, new arguments and whatnot brought by about by a non-party. This is really a new form of an amicus brief. And I'm happy to report that the lawyers for the plaintiff, specifically attorney Stephen uh, Stambule, uh, an excellent lawyer. We've talked a lot about him before. Uh, Stephen has done a great job in a lot of cases, including the Anton Young case, and he wrote a very powerful opposition to this, making a whole host of re arguments as to why this is no good. And uh, I will put a link to his brief down below, his motion to strike. He moved to strike this um, you know, Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 28J notice uh, on the grounds that it was improper because every town is not a party, number one. And also, this is an attempt to add, to add additional briefing as opposed to bring to the attention other things. He also made, I think, another very powerful point and observation that I made when I skimmed through uh, the things they actually submitted because I actually took a look at their long, long appendix, which is here. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, okay? So I took a look at all this myself. I skimmed it. And you know what stood out to me? And I'm glad to say Stephen um, uh, Stambule made the excellent argument here that indeed every one of these is too late in time. Not a single analog, not a single law or regulation that every town brought to the Second Circuit's attention speaks to anything about the Second Amendment at the time of the founding, 1791, or any of this. In fact, I think the earliest law they, they cite to is a New York City law from 1858 that's literally right before the Civil War and everything else is after the Civil War. They even have some 20th century laws, which the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that's absolutely, totally irrelevant if it's in the 20th century. So the truth is, and I'm happy to say that Stephen made a, Stephen uh, Stambule made a powerful argument that indeed it was too late and to silly anyway. The only, um, uh, and he did a great job, by the way, arguing the right facts. He pointed out that, for example, uh, in addition to the fact that, that these uh, provisions or these restrictions were given to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. There's a no analysis of the how or the why. Uh, you know, these these are most of these, as you know, are anti-poaching, they're anti-hunting laws or, or hunting restrictions, uh, have nothing to do with the ability to carry a gun peaceably for self-defense. And that is a good point. Beyond that, he also does a great job pointing out that indeed these laws are all way too late. And for example, he cites to a whole host of Supreme Court precedent, including, of course, the Espinoza case, which we've talked about uh, repeatedly here, that says that 30, you know, the Justice John Roberts, uh, in his majority opinion, in the Espinoza versus Montana case, literally rejected 30 state laws, not 30 city laws, not 30 town laws, not 30 locality laws, 30 state laws, 30 state laws at the end of the 19th century that if you bought into what the state of Montana was saying would have restricted and narrowed the scope of the First Amendment, it's religious clauses, just as Robert says that those all come too late, that nothing about those 30 state laws from the late 19th century who have any bearing on the 1791 meaning of the First Amendment, including the First Amendment's religious clauses. And uh, Stephen does a great job of making the argument here in his motion to strike. So congratulations on that. He also cites to, of course, Bruin pointing out that you, use, you can use late 19th century historical analogs as a basis for confirming or affirming, confirming or affirming 1791's understanding of the Second Amendment. That's why they could conceivably be relevant, but only relevant in a one-way ratchet kind of way to affirm the 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment. But what cannot happen under any set of circumstances is that late 19th century or certainly not 20th century uh, historical analog laws under any set of circumstances can cut back on the uh, 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment. That is a total absolute no-no uh, up and down the line. And Stephen uh, Stimbule did a great job in arguing exactly that, which is the right answer. The only thing I might have suggested uh, to, of course, strengthen the motion to strike, I think this is probably unnecessary in this case, and I'm not surprised he didn't mention it. But I think whenever you're arguing the 1791 
versus the 1868 14th Amendment point, I think it's always a good idea to cite to my article, the Mark Smith article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, because my article has a lot of points that you cannot make in a brief because briefs have page limitations or word limitations. My law review article did not have that, so I was able to capture a whole host uh, of countless examples of the Supreme Court doing exactly what they should be doing, which is applying the 1791 Bill of Rights to state restrictions, to state laws. And by capturing all those cases and all that analysis in an article, it's always good to cite to the Mark Smith Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy on the 1791 versus 1868 debate. It's very favorable. And of course, I think, uh, I haven't done the math yet, but I, I've skimmed it. I think that article may have been cited something like uh, 18 or 19 times to the U.S. Supreme Court just now in Rahimi. Again, I haven't double-checked it, but I think it's something like that from a quick skim. So obviously it's uh, being taken pretty seriously uh, by the people litigating in the Supreme Court. So that might be the only thing I would have done to, uh, you know, add to the motion to strike, which I think was extremely powerful and just excellently done uh, by Stephen uh, Strombrulli uh, and his colleagues at his firm in support of the plaintiff, Ivan Antonyuk. So, all right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today. I think this every town uh, attempt is going to go nowhere. Uh, nevertheless, you know, it's the Second Circuit. I don't think it's a great panel. I think it's kind of an anti-gun panel. So they may rule against the Second Amendment and in the process, they will screw this up six ways to Sunday. Uh, but, you know, judges that don't like guns and don't like the Second Amendment are going to find a way to screw it up one way or the other. So, uh, you know, whether it be five mistakes or 50 mistakes, uh, they're likely going to get it wrong. It's just the way it's going to be in the Supreme Court. Ultimately, it's going to have to fix these inferior court mistakes yet again. It's unfortunate and frustrating that it takes so long. Uh, nevertheless, it's the legal system we have, and uh, it's what we got, and that's what I have to talk about because it's the system we live in. So, you know, that's why I try to uh, speak the truth to you, even if it's good, if it's bad, or it's ugly. I have to tell you where we really stand because it does a disservice to you if I simply just uh, uh, speak about rainbows and unicorns, even when that's not justified. I don't think that, I don't think that's fair to you or to the Second Amendment movement, and uh, I generally don't like to do anything like that uh, unless I really believe it. So. All right. Uh, again, hope you learned something here today. If you have not subscribed, uh, please do so. Please like this video. Help me spread the word and to let you know let your friends know about it. And don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table two A.